Physics Colloquium, and today we have a very special uh, guest, Professor John Rogers from the University of Michigan, who are champagne. And more special for me, he is my PhD advisor. Uh, actually, he is my personal hero. Uh, I learned pretty much everything from him. And let me give you a little bit of introduction about uh, his background. And he got his uh, BS degree from uh, the University of Texas at Austin, from Physics and Chemistry. Then uh, he got his uh, MS degree from physics and chemistry at MIT, and then PhD in physical chemistry, began in MIT. Then he was a Harvard fellow. Uh, he worked with uh, John, uh, George Whiteside, chemistry and chemical biology. Then he joined Dell Labs in 2000, sorry, 1997. Uh, he worked there, and then he joined the University of Illinois as a founder professor. And he has been working on flexible electronics, bioelectronics, and today he's going to talk about how to uh, integrate biology, which is completely different than the conventional electronic materials. Uh, being his student, I'm really honored to be uh, presenting him. Uh, if you ask a grad student, he will tell you a lot of bad things about the uh, PhD advisor. For example, if you ask him, I think he will be complaining for a couple of hours about me. <laughs> and so we really, when I was a grad student, we really sit down and we talk about what's better about John. We couldn't find anything. <laughs> And at that time, I, I had an idea. I said, oh, the bad thing is this. We didn't write any proposal. So we did a lot of things, but we didn't write any proposal. This was the only bad thing that I can tell about John. OK, please welcome Professor John Rogers. All right, thank you for that introduction. Much too kind. I'm sure there are lots of bad stories. We'll hear about those at the dinner, this dinner conversation rather than <laughs> seminar conversation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and honored to have a chance to uh, give the uh, physics colloquium here. I was telling uh, Josh Kuhn uh, earlier, he's just now beginning to graduate his first PhD students. And I think uh, as a professor, there's nothing more um, uh, rewarding than to see your PhD students go on and be successful. And so uh, for that reason, it's really fun for me to be here uh, today to see you know, Josh Kuhn putting together his own research programs and talking to his colleagues and seeing all the exciting things going on uh, here at uh, Bill Camp. I've been uh, extremely impressed with everything uh, that I've seen up to this point. Um, what I'm going to do is, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, tell you about some of the things that we've been doing in Illinois uh, in attempts to use uh, semiconductor materials in ways that enable their intimate integration with the human body, the surfaces of the body or the internal organs of the body, uh, in systems that sort of conformally wrap those organs uh, and provide long-term operation, or in more recent efforts, uh, devices that are actually physically transient and can be uh, metabolized at a molecular level by uh, the biological uh, system uh, for applications that I'll tell you about uh, in a little bit. So these are uh, really two uh, separate topics, biointegrated uh, and transient, and I'll talk to you about them in succession. And in each case, I'll try to provide a little bit of perspective uh, you know, against uh, what's been uh, done in the past and try to uh, you know, highlight things that we've uh, tried to do to contribute to these uh, two fields. Uh, so that's the overview. I should also mention that my own core expertise is a material scientist. I have degrees in physics, but I really think of myself as a material scientist and an engineer. So a lot of what you'll see here is more in the realm of applied physics, uh, electrical engineering. I think there's a lot of physics there, too. Uh, but I put together a set of slides that really you know, focus on high-level concepts and device-level uh, embodiments and some materials and mechanics in between. So if you're interested in some of the more detailed physics aspects, I'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you about, the, uh, about those uh, topics af after the talk. Th this presentation won't, won't get into deep detail in some of those aspects. So uh, by way of introduction, let me just tell you uh, something you already know, which is that uh, silicon integrated circuit technology has been uh, spectacularly successful uh, since its invention, you know, uh, 50 years ago, since the invention of the uh, transistor, 60 years ago. And uh, you can really see that uh, in terms of the technology evolution where, you know, 40, 30 years ago or so, you want to buy a uh, computer, it would be something huge, you'd uh, take up a large space on your desk, uh, a lot of computing power would uh, fill entire rooms. And the purpose of these kinds of systems were really narrowly defined by specialized applications in industrial and scientific uh, computing. And what has happened is over the intervening uh, decades, a relentless miniaturization in the individual switching elements of the integrated circuit, the transistor uh, size reduction, has allowed uh, higher and higher functionality to be packed into smaller and smaller footprints, uh, allowing for higher and higher frequency operation and reducing the cost also tremendously on a per transistor basis. 
to learn how you to take the uh, systems that used to fill rooms and now you can put them in your backpack uh, or you can even put them in your pocket. And you think about that from a technology standpoint, that is a spectacular series of successes around basic scientific understanding and engineering implementation, manufacturing science that has allowed that to happen. But if you think about it, you know, maybe the more remarkable thing is the qualitative impact uh, that this technology evolution has had on the way the technology is actually used from specialized purposes to ones that now permeate every aspect of our daily lives and really form not, a, not just a, a computational resource, but a resource for personal communications, entertainment, and productivity enhancement. And so if you think about it in terms of a past and, and a present, you could ask where are things going in the future. And for the most part, you don't have to be that creative to think about where things are going in the future because the semiconductor industry has already developed a roadmap that tells you exactly where you're going to be in the future for the next 10 years or so. And it's all about uh, relentless and continued miniaturization in the sizes of the transistor. So ever shrinking critical dimensions, making things smaller, allowing you to pack more of them per unit area, allowing them to switch higher at higher speeds and lower voltages, and on a per unit basis allows them to be cheaper and cheaper. And if you think about that as a future, there's a lot of very interesting fundamental questions around the physics of transistor operations, sort of at the sub uh, 10 nanometer gate uh, regime. There's all kinds of electrical engineering questions of how you do uh, circuit design, and you have 10 billion transistors available to you. And there's a lot of uh, questions around the optics and the manufacturing science and how you're going to make that happen. So tremendously interesting topics in science and engineering in the service of a future of, electro uh, of a, a technology that has a trillion dollar global footprint. So every reason in the world to work on topics related to that particular future. And if you talk to people who are working in electronic material science or uh, electrical engineering uh, that relate to integrated circuits, probably 99.9% .9 of them are working toward that type of uh, future. It's a good one. That is not the future, however, that we're thinking about. We're thinking about a different future that addresses a characteristic of the integrated circuit that has remained static ever since the very first commercial deployment uh, of transistor. And that is the fact that the integrated circuit, every commercial integrated circuit that has ever been sold has been built on a silicon wafer or a semiconductor wafer, more generally speaking. And as a result, the uh, integrated circuits themselves are flat, they're planar, they're inflexible, they're brittle. If you drop on the ground, they'll shatter in a million pieces. And that kind of uh, geometrical mechanical characteristic is reflected directly in the geometry and the mechanical properties of the devices that, that are built out of them. So you think about a laptop or a cell phone or any computer system, uh, they're, you know, they're hard and, and rigid and planar. Uh, and they, they cannot be bent. And that's really a reflection of the guts of the device, that, that they are built on uh, uh, silicon wafers. So that is fine. If you want to you know, build an iPhone, you put it in your pocket, it's fine, actually, that it doesn't flex. Maybe you don't even want that. Uh, but if you wanted to take this kind of uh, technology and this kind of sophistication and bring it to bear on important problems in human health, this kind of shape and mechanics is a problem. If you want to take this device and you want to study neuroscience, you want to do interventional therapy on a mental condition uh, associated with the brain. In principle, you would like to be able to take this thing and integrate it with the surface of the brain, but that's a problem. There's a huge mismatch between the mechanics and the shape of this device and the surface uh, of the brain. If you wanted to integrate this with the skin, ideally you'd like to be able to take the integrated surface and just melt it into the surface of the epidermis to form a really intimate, high information content uh, interface to the body in a way that's completely compliant and non-constrained uh, on the motions of the skin. You can't do that if you're stuck on the semiconductor wafer. Likewise, if you're interested in interventional cardiology, you might want to be able to put electronics and sensors around the entire epicardial surface. Uh, that kind of 3D geometry is something that you can't access today. So this is the uh, goal that, that we have uh, in mind, is try to how to reformulate electronics to look more like biology. So you can do integration with the brain or the skin or the heart. Those are three organ systems that we focus on a lot. And we think that that could be important because it could lead to another qualitative shift and expansion in the way the integrated circuits are uh, being used uh, in a way that might not be enabled by the more straightforward semiconductor industry roadmap vision of the future. So moving from personal to something that's bio-integrated and having uh, value in uh, clinical human uh, health care. Okay, so that's the idea. Um, we've done work on all three of these systems. I'm just going to tell you about the skin uh, integrated devices because the same principles apply to brain and heart. And the only difference here is the, the biological context in which the devices are being used. So let me start with skin. And you might say, uh, you know, haven't people thought about integrating uh, you know, electronics with the outside surface of the body for a long time already? Uh, and you would be right about that. 
In fact, it even predates the uh, transistor. So you can go back, this is a magazine cover from 1945. They have a very innovative idea for integrating a radio you know, with the body. They have this uh, cool idea for you know, building a hat that in integrates the uh, antenna, and you have the battery pack, and the vacuum tubes down here, and you have wires sort of uh, draped around. I think the concept was something related to entertainment, although it's hard to imagine how that would really work in an entertainment sense. And that was not uh, a unique um, you know, kind of idea. This is something that people uh, thought about a lot back in those days, and they got a lot more sophisticated. Two years later, they had this, which was a lot better in some ways, I guess. Uh, you know, had more integration in the hat. Uh, you move the antenna a little bit outside of the hat, uh, and you got to do something with the vacuum tubes, so they decided to like, make little horns out of this, some kind of fashion statement, I assume. Uh, so it's a little bit more sophisticated, but still, you know, not looking that good. So you know that's uh, pre-transistor days, and of course you know with the uh, invention of the integrated circuit and all the Moore's law scaling that happened afterwards, you can now do much more sophisticated things that are body integrated at some level. And so maybe some of you guys have a Fitbit or Jawbone device. Uh, these are pretty interesting. They're accelerometers. They have uh, Wi-Fi interfaces to a smartphone, basically in the form of watch band. So it has not addressed anything related to the underlying mechanics or geometry of the integrated circuit. You've just avoided the intimate integration with the body by putting it in a watch form. And that's fine if you want to do very basic measurements of activity level, but it doesn't provide a very uh, efficient or high information content interface to the body. And in fact, a lot of the accelerometry that's done in that way is highly inaccurate. This thing rattling around on the wrist does not really tell you that much about you know, the overall activity uh, level of your body. But still, it's pretty good. Uh, it's a lot better than that. And it allows you to do different types of things. Moving beyond entertainment uh, is the point into the realm of fitness and wellness. Now, if you want to do more sophisticated measurements of the body, you really have to develop an intimate skin interface. The skin is a great window into underlying physiological health. Uh, and it provides a good measurement interface, but not like this. You have to start developing an intimate contact so you can do precision temperature measurement, for example, or you can measure surface potential on the skin to allow you to determine uh, aspects of cardiovascular health, for example, or uh, brain, brainwave monitoring and so on. And there's where it starts getting ugly. So if you take a block like this, the only way to uh, you know, develop an interface of the skin is to put a tight strap associated with it. So you have this hockey puck that's pushed against your chest. That's fine for a few hours, but for a few days, this is impossibly uh, uncomfortable. So nobody does that. Uh, and so that's really the uh, opportunity that we're looking at. So the future, the standard future, would be uh, align this technology with Moore's Law uh, future and then just make these devices smaller and smaller. But it never really solves the skin integration problem. So what we would uh, start thinking about is, is there a better way to do this that would rely, that would yield more clinically relevant, uh, you know, more information rich uh, content. And so in that sense, it's useful more to look at what's used in the hospital rather than what's out in the consumer uh, world. And so if you go to the hospital, you measure EKG, this is the way it's done. You have uh, point contact wires that are taped to the surface of the skin with adhesive tapes. And each one of those point contacts is electrically connected to a separate box of uh, you know, integrated circuits and data that, that acquisition systems that allow the potentials that are measured at these localized points on the body to be interpreted and recorded, uh, such that the waveforms can uh, determine things uh, related, as I mentioned before, cardiovascular health. This is fine uh, for a hospital, but again, as with those straps, this is nothing that people want to wear long term. It looks a lot like that old uh, transistor uh, radio uh, wearable device in the sense you got wires all over the place. But in some ways it's worse because not only do you have the wires draped all over the place, now you have a sticky tape with a hard electrode pressed against your skin. And that's fine for a little while, but it begins to be like Chinese water torture for most folks. It begins to be painful, literally painful, because the properties of the tape are not matched to the properties of the skin. The skin is soft, compliant, stretchy. The tape is not uh, typically just uh, bend it. And moreover, in order to get high signal quality, you typically use coupling gels uh, that uh, reduce the impedance, uh, contact impedance between the electrode and the skin to enable high fidelity recording. And that gel dries out. So the other aspect of this is you really have separated the interface to the body from the electronics. And so as a result, you really can't scale up the number of contacts. You have millions of transistors here, but only three contacts to the body. Uh, and that's obviously an efficient way to do integration. You get a little bit better. If you take that box of electronics, you crack it open, you pull the chips out, you can mount them on a flexible PCB tape, so a piece of poly in it, and then you can adhere that to the skin. And people have thought about this. This is an actually working device, it's just a, bit, a vision or a concept. Uh, and this is a little more sophisticated, but it's still deficient because the tape, pr the properties of the tape are not matched to the properties of the skin. 
and so it creates uh, a discomfort and uh, you know an irritating interface to the skin. So it's really in that context that we begin to think about what would be the ideal uh, interface uh, of a device technology to the skin. And we looked around, and we decided the best model to think about is a kid's temporary tattoo. It's just a, it's, it is a device at some level, just a passive one, but it goes on the skin, it looks great, and by, by the way, you don't even know that it's there because it doesn't mechanically or thermally or in a mass uh, sense load the motion of the skin. So the skin is freely moving. This device just follows that motion so you can't feel it. It's mechanically invisible. And as a result, you can leave these kind of devices on the skin for a long time. So the question is, could you uh, come up with a set of materials and mechanics and physics concepts that allow you to do an integrated circuit that looks like this? Uh, and if you could do that, then that might be an interesting uh, outcome to think about. So what does that really mean? That means you want the entire integrated circuit to be ultra thin, as thin as you can go. We thought five microns was a good target when we started this. As light as possible, avoid mass loading. So uh, maybe a millimetergram per centimeter squared was, was a target we thought about. Uh, ultra low in modulus, you want it to be as soft as possible. I'll tell you the physics of why that is in a second. We thought five kilopascals would be a good target because that happens to be the modulus of the brain tissue. The skin modulus is a little bit higher than that, more like 100 kilopascals, but that was an aspirational target when we first started out. It turns out that the skin can not only fold and bend and wrinkle, but it also stretches. It doesn't stretch by a lot. It's not like a rubber band, but it can stretch about 30% before it starts to tear. And so if you want to match the mechanical properties of the skin, it not only needs to have a low modulus, but an elastic response up to at least 30% strength, maybe beyond. And then furthermore, it needs to be air and water, water permeable to accommodate transepidermal water loss through the surface of the skin. And it's absolutely essential that you can waterproof the active components of the circuit from the skin to avoid unwanted short uh, into the body. So those were the ideas. Now, if you think about it, uh, this is not easy because the modulus of silicon, for example, uh, is 150 gigapascal. The stretchability of the silicon is 1% tensile. It cracks. Uh, and the thickness of a conventional integrated circuit is about one millimeter. So these are uh, dramatically different kinds of physical characteristics than those that you see uh, in a wafer. And why are they important? Let me tell you a little bit about the uh, interface mechanics uh, associated with adhesion and how that drives us into a regime of ultra-thin, ultra-low modulus um, uh, construct. So you can uh, do analytical cal calculations of interface stresses that could drive the lamination between a piece of electronics and the skin uh, in a generalized sense in which the electronics is just considered as a slab of material with modulus E and thickness H. It's sitting on a piece of uh, skin that has a modulus he, here, E skin, and thickness, let's say, one uh, millimeter, five, five kilopascals on the skin. It's a little bit low, but just for the purpose of discussion, uh, that was the assumption. And then you can compute not only the shear stresses that develop the interface, but also the peeling stresses, both of which can initiate delamination and cause the device to flake off of the skin when the skin is deformed. And you can think about the magnitude of those stresses four different parameters associated with electronics, in particular the Young's modulus and the thickness. And you can compute those stresses as a function of position starting from the edge of the piece of electronics uh, out to its center. And this is what you end up seeing here. So these are the shear stresses here, peeling stresses, as a function of normalized distance away from the edge. So the edge is sitting over here. And you can do that for three cases. One is the case of a silicon chip that you just glue to the surface of the skin. Uh, and this is the least uh, you know, attractive way to do uh, skin integrated electronics. And just as a point of comparison, 100 gigapascal, 300 microns. You can think about conventional flexible electronics. A lot of people working on that. This is just electronics on a sheet of plastic, where the plastic might be polyimided in modules of 5 gigapascal and a thickness of 50 microns. And then you can think about skin light. It's more in the regime of this uh, temporary tattoo. 5 kilopascals and 5 microns. And then you look at the peak stresses, uh, and you can compare them. So silicon has the highest peak stress, and the peaks in the case of the shear stress develop at the edges. So delamination would start at the edge with uh, the case of silicon, uh, and it would start early because there's very large uh, stresses there. Uh, plastic substrate flexible electronics, you have an improvement, uh, and then uh, skin-like uh, is even further improved. That's partly because the modules are being dri driven down, partly because of the thickness. So you have this trend line, same thing you see in the peeling stresses. Uh, silicon chip is the worst, flexible electronics is next, Skin like is next. 
So the point that I want to make here is around the magnitudes of these trends, not, not the overall qualitative trend, because you probably need to just guess that, but you need to do, do, the, uh, do the calculation. Think about the ratios. Think about the ratios of silicon chip to plastic sheet for two cases. One is you pull the skin in tension up to 100%, and the other is that you bend the surface of the skin to radius of curvature of 3 millimeters. And you compute the peak stresses uh, for silicon chip to plastic sheet and compare the case for shear and peeling. And remarkably, the ratios are almost all, all the same in these four cases for chip to plastic sheet. And moving from chip to sheet helps, but only by about a factor of five. So that might have some level of influence in the way you think about adhesion management, but not at a qualitative one since it's just a factor of five. But now if you consider silicon chip compared to electronic skin, the skin-like geometry, look at the same ratios, almost five orders of magnitude. So now that, that has a dramatic effect on the way you think about materials that can engineer strong adhesion between the device uh, and the skin. And in fact, with the very tiny interface stresses that develop when you have an electronic skin type uh, mechanics and thicknesses uh, are so low that Van der Waals forces can keep the device on the skin without any adhesives or straps or penetrating pins or tapes at all. Uh, and that's, that's uh, an important outcome and really drives the uh, uh, design around low modulus and small thickness. And you can kind of see that qualitatively in uh, experiments that you can do just with a sheet of rubber. So here's a sheet of rubber, it's polydimethyl siloxane, uh, with a certain cross-linking density that yields a modulus of about uh, half a megapascal or so. And we have a thickness of about 100 microns. You can laminate that onto the skin, it's no problem. You put it near the wrist region, uh, and then you can flex the wrist, and you'll see the physics that I just mentioned uh, to you. You flex it, that's sort of the bending motion. And what you see, there's the uh, delamination, starts there, it starts to flake off. Then you can pull the skin in tension. Again, you see delamination starts at the edges and then runs across the interface. If you take the exact same material, and reduce the cross-linking density. So now you reduce the modulus by nearly a factor of 10. So it's now 100 kilopascal instead of 500 kilo kilopascal, half uh, megapascal. Same interface chemistry, same Van der Waals uh, non-specific interactions between the rubber and the skin, but totally different outcome from the standpoint of the delamination and the adhesion mechanics. And you can see that here. If you do the exact same experiment, you stretch the skin, uh, there's no delamination at all. Again, no adhesive at all. Uh, in this case, just Van der Waals adhesion. Uh, and you can flex the wrist. Same thickness, same material, uh, and it stays bonded. So in some ways, that's kind of qualitative. I'm not sure it's really been appreciated in the context of skin-mounted uh, electronics. And you can do that at a quantitative level. You can do uh, experiments not involving skin, but using kind of artificial skin and silicone, and then PDMS with different mixing ratios, uh, causing different uh, stiffnesses. Uh, at different thicknesses, you can look at the compressive strain at which delamination initiates. Uh, you can do theory and you can do experiment. And so we know everything about the interface and mechanics associated with these systems. So we understand the impact uh, then, uh, of modulus and thickness on this critical property associated with skin-mounted uh, electronics. So then the question is, how do you get there? Again, the starting point is the one that I mentioned several times already. Integrated circuits conventionally built on silicon wafers, millimeter thick, 150 gigapascal in modulus, 1% uh, uh, stretchability. And you know, if you look at that, you might think, uh, we really need to go to a completely different material because it's never going to work with silicon. Maybe you need to go to a polymer-based electronic system in order to get, get in this regime of mechanics. And that's certainly one direction that we've worked on. Uh, thinking about polymer small molecules, Joe Schoon, when he was in the group, we're doing a lot with uh, carbon nanotubes. I still think that that's an attractive approach as an alternative to silicon for these kind of bio-integrated systems. Um, but I think you know, what's been most useful for us is to just think more deeply about how you might be able to deploy silicon to achieve effective mechanics at the level that I just described to you, but with silicon. And their big advantage there is you would be building on a tremendous depth of scientific and engineering knowledge around that class of material, ionic crystal and silicon, for integrated circuit applications. And you would also be able to align yourself with a, a, an incredibly powerful manufacturing infrastructure. So how do you do it? How do you get silicon into an integrated circuit that has those properties? There's a couple of really simple ideas. The first one of which is that the silicon wafer has uh, you know, this lack of bendability, partly because of the intrinsic mechanical properties of the material, but also because the wafer is a millimeter thick. If you uh, think about the, how the bending rigidity scales with thickness, it goes with the cube of the thickness. So you decrease the thickness by a little bit, you impact by a huge amount the bendability, the ability of the uh, silicon to flex. 
And in fact, if you take a silicon wafer, and there's a two-step etching process that you can use with a silicon 111 wafer to allow you to slice very, very thin, sort of 100 nanometer thick ribbons of device quality silicon off the surface of the wafer. If you do that, then you end up with a form of silicon that's really floppy and flexible, just by virtue of that cubic scaling of bending rigidity with thickness, number one. And then number two is for any material, the peak bending strains go down linearly in thickness. So not only the degree of bendability, but the bending stiffness are, are dramatically impacted by just making the silicon thin. So that works pretty well. You can slice material off the surface of the wafer, then if you want, you can uh, work your way down through the thickness, create a lot of very high quality semiconductor material in this very thin, flexible geometry. So that's idea number one. Idea number two, and again, I won't get into the details, just try to give you a high level uh, idea of this, is that if you want something to stretch, it goes beyond bending the can. So no matter how thin I get silicon, it will never stretch if I just focus on thickness. You need another different qualitative idea, and that is take this thin silicon. Now you want an overall system that's ultimately stretchable, so you probably want to use a rubber substrate. That's in fact what we do. But not a rubber substrate just in its static state. You stretch it out a little bit. Then you use surface chemistry to allow you to chemically bond those silicon ribbons to the surface of a silicone rubber substrate in that pre-stretched state. Then you allow the silicone to relax, and what happens is it induces compressive stresses in the silicon that's mounted on the surface. And if those compressive stresses exceed a critical stress, what will happen is you will spontaneously induce a buckling instability that creates silicon in this kind of wavy geometry. So there's silicon ribbon one, two, and three. There's the underlying rubber substrate. This is what it looks like when you allow that silicone rubber pre-strain to snap back to its original uh, uh, dimensions. You create wavy silicon. So it's a very hard material integrated with a very soft material, but generating a composite structure where the overall mechanics is dominated by the soft substrate, not by the silicon rigid material on top. And it's in a geometry that allows an effective end-to-end -end stretchability in a way that doesn't exceed fracture thresholds in the silicon. So you take this thing, you can stretch it out. The way the silicon wave structure responds to that stretching deformation is through changes in the structure of the waves. So the wavelengths go up and the amplitudes go down. And likewise, when you compress it, wavelengths, uh, amplitudes go up, wavelengths go down. And so back and forth like that, completely linear, elastic response dominated by the substrate, and now you have uh, a very high performance active semiconductor on top. So it's essentially accordion bells physics. There's not that much uh, beyond it in terms of just conceptually thinking about it. But the mechanics turned out to be very subtle. You have very hard material and very soft material. They're intimately coupled by the surface chemistry. And it's so it's a composite system at some level. And we spent nearly a year just studying the mechanics of this test structure because in these kinds of systems, mechanics design becomes as important as circuit design. You have to design the layout of the system so you can accommodate the maximum stretch uh, defined by the application that you have in mind. So we've written probably you know, half a dozen papers just, just on the mechanics of this uh, system. But I, I won't go into the details of those uh, aspects uh, today. There's more uh, details. So those are the ideas. Thin uh, geometries to induce flexibility and then controlled buckling mechanics to affect stretchability. Now the buckling I showed you uh, previously is just very simple, one-dimensional wave structures. It turns out that you can do buckling out of the plane. You can also induce buckling in the plane. And in fact, the way to do that is to create filamentary serpentine structures that are uh, interconnected into a mesh and build all of your active electronics into this mesh-like structure bonded to a pre-strained, biaxially pre-strained now, silicone substrate, allow it to relax and get both lateral and out-of-plane buckling and bending. Uh, in a way that yields a composite system with a very low modulus, even though you have active silicon and other rigid inorganic semiconductors embedded into that open spiderweb mesh. So that's the idea, the qualitative uh, concept around it. Because uh, mechanics design is so important, everything that we do involves full 3D finite element modeling done with theoretical uh, mechanicians or collaborators at Northwestern University, so we know exactly what's going on in the system. And we can use those theories to optimize the layout. Uh, and the name of the game here is you want a maximum aerial coverage of hard material for your circuits, uh, but in an integrated composite whose mechanical properties are dominated by the soft material. It's almost exactly the opposite of the way you traditionally think about composite engineering. A lot of times you want a little bit of a hard material to make a soft material a lot more robust. 
Here it's exactly the same. You want to load it up with hard material, but keep the mechanics dominated by the soft material. So that's, that's an interesting design space, composites and, and mechanics and nanomaterials. But anyway, this is what you can do. In this case, the silicon substrate is very thin, about 30 microns, very low in modulus. If you get all the mechanics right, guided by theory, you end up with stress strain curves in this integrated circuit that are almost perfectly matched to the skin. So the skin is here. This is pig skin. It's pretty similar to uh, human skin. 160 gig, uh, kilopascal, roughly linear elastic, responds up to about 15% strain. Starts to go nonlinear, a higher effective modulus. As you continue to strain, you eventually rip the skin at about 30%. But if you look at the uh, stress strain curves for deformation and stretching along X and along Y for this integrated circuit, almost perfectly matched to the skin. That's by theoretical design that has uh, these kind of properties. Perfectly matched, but actually a, a wider linear elastic response range. If you look at the uh, calculation, it's almost spot on with the experimental results. So this is uh, the design approach, how you do it. I think it uh, raises some opportunities around physics. Like how do you think about structuring these filaments in a way that optimizes the stretchability, minimizes the modulus? And what we have discovered is that ideas in fractal design actually turn out to be really useful uh, in this context. And so these are some uh, piano curves. Uh, a third order uh, iteration of uh, a piano type uh, geometry, and it provides a more systematic way to define the filamentary layout of the circuit. And the mechanics is such that it involves a nested hierarchical series of spring type geometries associated with the fractal layouts. So you have small string, uh, springs nested into larger springs, uh, and yet larger ones here. And so you can sort of study this. Uh, the mechanics uh, turns out to be pretty interesting and unusual. Uh, and you can design the fractals to achieve any kind of variable stretching you want. You can either have responses that are completely isotropic, independent of stretching direction, or certain directions that will stretch more than others. And so there's a lot of variability and design opportunities associated with the fractal layout. Uh, and we just recently had a paper uh, on this, but I think this is going to be a, uh, a design approach that's going to be attractive for us going, going forward with some very recent uh, ideas. Now the uh, concept is that those ideas are almost generalizable to any class of material, not just silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium nitride, metals, polymers, uh, insulators, uh, whatever you want. Uh, and so here's some examples. Uh, a silicon transistor source drain gate in this filamentary serpentine design that's halfway through the fad. That's the full fad there. If you measure the ID characteristics, you see device properties are almost comparable to what we would see in an otherwise similarly designed channel structure on a silicon wafer. So you haven't lost anything in terms of performance, and the uh, switching characteristics are better than, by a factor of a thousand than uh, an analogous device that you might develop in polymer. But it's not only uh, silicon transistors. You can do strain gauges, temperature sensors. I'll give you a couple examples of that. Uh, even PM junction diodes for maybe solar cells or photo detectors. Pretty much anything can be dropped into this overall uh, construct of how to do hard soft integration in stretchable electronics. So if you put it all together, you end up with uh, devices that look like this. They laminate onto the skin. They're uh, thin, as thin as the epidermis, mechanically matched to the epidermis. So Van der Waals forces are strong enough to keep it adhered, even when the skin is uh, severely deformed. So we put the device on the postdoc who's doing the work, and then we poke them with a glass rod and kind of see how that moves around. The skin kind of moves, and then the circuit just follows that motion, much like a temporary transfer tattoo. Now, because it's Van der Waals adhesion, it means you can easily peel it off. You just grab it at an edge and peel. And this is what it looks like. You peel it off. There's tweezers there holding the device by a by corner. And you can see sort of the mechanics here. It's so thin and so low in modulus, it doesn't even support its own weight. It just collapses down on top of itself. And so if you're looking at this, you might wonder, how in the heck am I going to hold it to mount it up on the skin in the first place? Uh, and that turns out to be really easy. We just borrow, borrow ideas from the world of temporary transfer tattoos. We just want, use a water-soluble plastic sheet as a temporary handle for the piece of dermal electronics. Flip it over, place it against the skin, then wash away this uh, plastic sheet. Uh, and then that constitutes the mounting process. And uh, uh, only the uh, epidermal uh, electronics is left uh, after that process. So let me see how this goes. There's a movie that shows you uh, how that uh, works a variety of ways to mount it up. This was the way we initially did it. So this is a uh, uh, just a test platform. It's not an integrated system that has independent functions. It's just an array of transistors, uh, RF diodes, inductors, capacitors, LC oscillators, the temperature gauges, strain gauges. There's an inductive coil here for power delivery, and then an RF antenna that runs around the outside. What you're seeing is the device is laminated against the skin, uh, so the circuit is in direct contact with the skin. 
On top of the circuit is that thin silicone substrate, and on top of that is this transparent water-soluble polymer, it's PVA in this case. And the postdoc has put it on his forearm and is now slowly dissolving away the PVA by applying a little bit of water uh, with his uh, index finger. So the PVA will soon be gone, uh, and at that point the epidermal electronics will be in conformal contact, even with the structured surface of the skin, and adhering there just by Van der Waals interaction. So the PVA is gone, uh, you can dry it off, uh, and we'll come back. And you can pinch the skin and now watch the mechanics of this integrated piece of electronics on, on, the, on the skin. So this is electronics you're looking through the silicone sheet. This is the boundary of that silicone substrate. So again, 30 microns in thickness, 50 kilopascals roughly. And as you uh, pinch and uh, deform the skin, you will notice that the skin wrinkles and deforms in ways away from the circuit that are almost indistinguishable from the way that it deforms where the circuit is located. And, and, uh, in particular, look at the uh, period of those wrinkle structures that uh, appear upon uh, compressive stress associated with pinching looks pretty much the same at the circuit as it does away from the circuit. And that's by design. So the circuit is not mechanically loading the skin uh, at all, and that's consistent with uh, finite element modeling of the mechanics. So again, as I mentioned before, is Van der Waals adhered, it stays adhered when you pinch, uh, but the absolute value of the adhesion is not high. It's just the fact that we've driven the interface stresses down to these very low levels by going to this very thin, low modulus geometry. As a result, you can grab it by the edge and just peel it off pretty easily. It doesn't even tug on the skin that much, uh, except at funny points like that, which I don't really understand. But uh, anyway, it eventually comes off, uh, and you'll have a chance to see uh, what it looks like. And somewhat disgusting, but you know, it's a, like, a, like a piece of skin. So if you wanted to adhere a little bit better, uh, there may be a reason to do that. We figured, why not just use a real temporary tattoo? It already has a FDA-approved glue layer. Just mount the uh, uh, circuit on the back side of that tattoo and just you know, put it on. And, um, and that works uh, pretty well also. And it has the additional advantage that it conceals the electronics. You know, so if you're into covert you know, spy games or something like that, you can have some uh, electronics underneath your tattoo. Nobody knows it there. Uh, and in that case, it's sort of in the, in the facial region of this tattoo, which is actually a custom tattoo. This is our Illinois pirate. Uh, we're nowhere near an ocean in Illinois, so pirate doesn't really make sense. But something about tattoos and pirates seem to, seem to go together. And in fact, this is a custom tattoo, as I mentioned. And it turns out you order a custom temporary tattoo, the minimum order number is 1,000. So we only needed about a dozen for this research. So I brought with me. Uh, the Line Eye Pirate Tattoos. So if anybody wants a free tattoo, you can have one after this talk. There's no electronics on this though. So this is not NSA surveillance going on over here. It's just uh, free tattoos. You can have them uh, if you want. So that's uh, what it looks like. What does the actual interface look like? If you create a polymer replica of the skin and then you put these devices on top of it, you notice that this sort of spiderweb mesh geometry does a good job in terms of the mechanics, but also the contact area is very high. And that uh, provides this good adhesive bond, but also provides a low impedance contact between the electronics and the skin. It's almost conformal to all regions of the skin, except for the most challenging cracks and crevices down, uh, down here. But probably 90% is in very good intimate contact. So not only can you do sensors, uh, circuits on the skin, but then you can do high quality sensors of electrical behavior. And there's all kinds of electrical activity associated with action of the skeletal muscles, the cardiac muscle, and the brain, as three examples. And so you can put these devices on your chest, and you can measure ECG. So these are waveforms that have a lot of uh, information content related to uh, uh, cardiac health. You can put them on a leg, and then you can walk around with these things, so you can measure certain aspects of gait. So you're walking, and then you're standing over here. This is epidermal electronics. That's the data. If you do the benchmark comparison against the gold standard, which is these tapes, conductive gels, and wires, this is what you get. You put this on the, on the leg. And more or less a similar signal level, similar signal to noise. So we're not saying it's offering an intrinsically lower impedance contact, but it's a totally different type of contact. So you don't uh, have wire and tape. Uh, you just have a very thin epidermal-like uh, device. And you're not doing point contact electrodes, but you do erase uh, very easily because you exploit all the advances in silicon uh, electronics to do that. You can also put these on the forehead. You can measure EEG, so you can measure brain waves. Uh, nothing too unexpected there. It's just an option. So if you think about measuring brain waves, you might think about brain-machine uh, interfaces. It's something to think about. But the fact that you can put these devices anywhere opens up opportunities for developing more generalized classes of human-machine interface, not necessarily based on the brain waves. 
which involve very low signal amplitudes and sort of hot, hard to develop a reliable interface in that way. But you can take these devices and you can put them anywhere, like you know, arm, neck, finger, jaw if you want. So if you're in a group, you got you know, a chance to put these devices all over the place. Uh, and these are the places that I'm aware of anyway, the students have put these devices. I can't say much more than that. But uh, you have uh, signal uh, that you can collect from, from any place. So it enables you know, maybe, maybe some more generalized thoughts about how to do interfaces. In fact, you can put these things on the net, and there's a lot of fine motor control associated with speech. And so you can measure spectrograms of EMG signals collected on the net. And if you work with uh, folks in electrical engineering, we work with Todd Coleman, they can develop a, sort of a pattern recognition algorithm to take a spectrogram like that and like that, which corresponds to uh, the data that you record when the subject is saying either vocally or uh, subvocally different words like stop, go. So you can develop a finite vocabulary of words where the uh, interpretation is done based on neck and G. You might imagine this as being useful for someone who suffers a disease of the trachea, or maybe you want to control a prosthetic, you can do it that way. Uh, my students were a little bit more interested in playing video games as a demonstrator. Uh, so we do that. So if you want to play video games with your neck, we have the technology to do that. So I'm not sure how big a market that is, but we can do it. This is a strategy game. You can move a cursor up, down, left, and right just by saying up, down, left, and right, recording the EMG. So that's one way to do it. This was early days, so this was uh, implemented in a software algorithm. We've subsequently done hardware implementation so that we can do more real-time control. Here's an example of control of a helicopter uh, down here. The postdoc over here has two separate devices mounted on both forearms. Uh, and by clenching his fists, rotating his fists, he can control uh, the helicopter uh, and move it around. I'll give you an example of that. So there's a set of commands. He rotates his fists like this. That corresponds to the command for the helicopter to launch. Uh, and then he'll uh, rotate his fists this way. He'll start rotating clockwise. As soon as he goes back to a neutral position, it'll stop. You see that? Stops. Now he clenches both fists. That corresponds to a command for the helicopter to fly. He'll release his fists and stop. Rotates his fist the other direction, that corresponds to land. Uh, then he'll spool it up again, it'll take off again. He'll uh, tilt his fist the other direction, uh, and it'll cause the helicopter to rotate uh, in a counterclockwise direction. Uh, it'll eventually uh, stop, he'll stop it over here. Uh, one second. Then clench his fist again, that corresponds to the command to fly, and he's trying to fly it back over here and land it in that box. You'll see it rotated down, and then it'll land, uh, and he missed. So he has to uh, work a little bit more. But you get the idea. There's not a lot of reason to sort of uh, refine that. That's just a concept. So you can do electrophysiological mapping. Um, you can do a lot of other things as well. You're sitting on the skin. And we were contacted by folks at uh, National Institutes of Health, experts in skin uh, science, dermatology, in particular precision thermometry on the skin. And they came to us and said, you know, could you use your patch to measure temperature? I initially thought, well, the temperature's not that interesting. It's like 98.6, 98.7, you may be determined if you have a fever or not, that's about it. But uh, I got convinced otherwise. I, I'm now a firm believer that there's a huge information content in precision temperature, so millikelvin precision temperature measurement on the skin. If you can do that in a spatially mapping way. So let me show you a movie that the NIH guys sent us uh, as part of a process to conv uh, convince us to work on this uh, temperature measurement. And what they do is they use a quarter million dollar IR camera to do full body uh, imaging of temperature. And what they're doing is measuring uh, an individual's walking on a treadmill. And they have to do a lot of image processing techniques to eliminate uh, uh, motion artifacts. And so that's what these spots correspond to, sort of hold the body fixed. So this individual is walking. You'll see a lot of interesting things happening across the body. But as he starts to go faster and faster, what will happen is he'll start to sweat. As he sweats, evaporative losses will cause an overall cooling of the body. That's not that interesting either. But as he starts to ex exercise more and more vigorously, you begin to uh, develop tremendous spatial variation uh, in the temperature. And this is not associated with droplets of sweat moving around on his body. This is actually associated with deep muscle vasculature that's pi piping heat from the deep muscle content uh, to the surface. And as that vasculature emerges at the surface, it corresponds to hot spots. And so you can imagine if you could measure temperature and map out some of this uh, variation, uh, that might be uh, really valuable uh, in terms of uh, assessing health uh, and wellness and, and doing it at a clinical level. So the question is how you do it without using a quarter million dollar camera and how you do it in a way that's compatible with just everyday life activities. And uh, that's where there was a very good match between these uh, devices that I've been talking to you about and that goal. 
Now here you want the mechanics mass, you want the uh, mass loading to be minimal, you also want thermal loading to be as small as possible. You don't want the patch to serve as an insulating coating and change the temperature in the region of the skin we're trying to measure it. So there's a whole set of design you have to go around thinking about the thermal mass and the uh, frustration in uh, transepidermal water loss that can potentially be imposed by these devices. You can avoid all those uh, issues and you can make, make a device that goes onto the skin and allows you a precision and temperature mapping that's as good as the quarter million dollar IR camera, in particular, precision at the 10 millikelvin level. If you can measure surface temperature at 10 millikelvin, you can see all kinds of subtle things uh, that, that you wouldn't necessarily expect would be possible. So here's two examples. You have the device measuring uh, temperature. Here's the epidermal sensor there. And here's the IR camera. We're matching, uh, measuring temperature right next to the individual sensors, make the array of sensors. And this is uh, IR uh, analysis of IR camera pixels right next to our sensor. And what you see is as this individual is sitting at rest, the temperature is not constant. It actually oscillates up and down. So perfect agreement with the IR camera. And the amplitude and the wet, uh, time periods of those oscillations tells you a lot about intrinsic vasoconstriction and vasodilation of the capillary beds in the surface of the skin. And those properties are telling you something about uh, the state of health of the individual. So that, there's a lot of information content here. Now what happens is after a period of rest, the individual is asked to start to do mental math. So this is subtraction and division done in the head, uh, you know, without pen and paper. And what you see is there's an immediate systematic decline in temperature. That's because you start to induce uh, firing of individual sweat glands, and that begins to cool the skin uh, by, a, by a very minor amount. But you can determine something about cognitive state then by measuring temperature, not only these intrinsic oscillations, but overall systematic changes. Here's another example. Perfect agreement between IR camera and sensor. Rest, you see these oscillations again. Now, this corresponds to physical stimulus, which you might expect, based on that movie I showed you, would cause sweating and a decrease in temperature. You see that. Uh, and then once the exercise starts, you, uh, you know, kind of have a, a fixed temperature down here. But the physical stimulus is what's interesting here. So we have a device on the left wrist, and the physical stimulus corresponds to rubbing two fingers together on the right hand. So you're rubbing your fingers here, and you can pick up a temperature change over here. So very, very precise uh, measurements, and you can see all kinds of subtle things uh, that, that could be very important. You can also look at time dynamic events. So you can constrict a blood vessel, in this case the ulnar artery, and then you can release it, and you can look at temporal transients in temperature associated with blood flow through near surface arteries. And here's what it looks like, all the different channels here, are sort of coincident with the ulnar artery, but only certain channels are directly uh, spatially overlapped. And those channels have all the information. In fact, you see uh, a, a downshoot, and then an overshoot, and an overdamped oscillation. And the details of that have to do with the elasticity uh, of the arteries. So you measure arterial stiffness uh, by doing this and then coupling it with uh, uh, mechanics models of uh, blood flow through the uh, artery. So additional things that you can do, look at time dynamic events. You can also do things that aren't even possible at all with the IR camera because you can use these tiny temperature sensors, they're basically resistive-based uh, temperature sensors, simultaneously as heaters. So you can pulse heat into the skin, and then you can watch how that heat diffuses. And it turns out that uh, measuring the diffusivity of the skin allows you to make um, uh, conclusions about the skin conductivity, which turn out to correlate very strongly with uh, moisture content. So you can measure hydration level as well uh, at the surface of the skin. Uh, and that's another uh, measurement capability you can't do with an IR camera. A lot of the stuff you'd like to be able to do purely wirelessly, you can do it by inductive coupling. This is one example. Uh, we have an uh, impedance uh, electrode pair here. We can measure galvanic response of the skin, uh, conductivity of the skin, just by looking at mutual inductance coupling between a primary coil here and a secondary coil that's built into this epidermal format and laminated onto the skin. And we can look at the effects of uh, applying moisture to the skin. This is an epidermal wireless measurement of uh, S11 uh, from the mutual inductance. And if you measure commercial contact moisture meter, you see a very uh, good correlation between these two types of uh, measurements. And wireless is really where you want to go. So let me give you another example of something. This is not healthcare, but this is going in that direction. So we are working with uh, Google to develop uh, data tattoos that go onto the skin. It's basically RFIDs tags with uh, a memory module, and then an inductive coil uh, that allows this skin integration. There, there's our friend, the uh, pirate, uh, just to set the scale here. Uh, that's the way the device looks. Uh, we've made functional systems. I'll just show you uh, a movie of that. This is one of these uh, devices on the skin. 
And what we're showing is readout onto an Android phone. The phone is brought into proximity, and this particular device just has a, a small uh, text string uh, embedded in it, uh, and so you can read out the uh, data there. Uh, and it works under compression. So the overall system is robust enough in terms of the uh, center frequency of the inductance of the coil that uh, you can read out even if the skin is under the uh, deformation. So this is very new stuff. I showed this to someone uh, and they looked at it and said, hey, that's really cool. You got to squeeze the data out of this thing. That's really pretty, pretty awesome. But that's not really what's happening here. So that's, uh, anyway, that's what you can do. They have these uh, in human clinical trials at a hospital in uh, Chicago. These are basically smart bandages that allow us to do precision temperature monitoring and uh, hydration state monitoring next to uh, wounds. So these are being used by uh, doctors in, in normal hospital settings. So it's just evaluations, but just trying to get this stuff you know, kind of out into the real world. In this case, we're using fractal designs uh, for the temperature sensors and the conductivity uh, measurement systems. And then we have uh, user-friendly uh, backend for uh, the docs to, to use. So that's kind of what we're doing. So this is uh, where we hope to go uh, eventually. I mentioned to you before that having these wires and tapes on your skin is sort of a nuisance. Uh, and that nuisance turns out to be extremely severe uh, in the case of the kind of monitoring they have to do with premature babies, for example. Because the skin is very fragile, the babies are very uh, weak, uh, and you got wires all over the place. So this is a, sort of a disastrous situation. We hope our research will allow you to go from this to something like this. And in case you're wondering, this is purely Photoshop, so this is not uh, epidermal. <laughs> Uh, that's what we hope will be possible. We think we have a lot of pe uh, pieces that will enable that to happen sooner uh, rather than later. Okay, so that's what, what's happening. Uh, I'm going to just spend five minutes on the resorbable stuff, sort of uh, running a little bit long here. But I just want to say that the ideas around epidermal skin integration immediately apply to the brain and the heart. And we've done a lot on the brain in the context of monitoring brain activity for uh, uh, surgical procedures used to treat acute cases of epilepsy. We work with uh, cardiologists on developing devices that can go around the entire outside surface of the heart to do uh, detailed electrophysiological measurements in the context of arrhythmias and defibrillation. So you can do measurement. You can also use these electrodes to stimulate in a complex spatial temporal way going far beyond what's possible just a point contact pacemaker. This is what we're doing, but just for fun with the LED just to show that you can do that. Uh, there's nothing that we have in mind at the moment uh, in terms of LEDs, but uh, having Christmas tree lights on your heart is kind of cool. So, uh, that. so let me, uh, like I said, just uh, five, five minutes on resorbable. I come back to the motivational slide that I gave you at the beginning to try to put our work in context with more uh, mainstream electronics. And I made the point that there's a lot of change associated with integrated circuits over the years. But the one thing that's not changed is the platform and the mechanics and the geometry. So that's what we were focused on and all this bio-integrated stuff I mentioned to you before. The other thing that has not changed from the very earliest days of the integrated circuit is that their primary appeal has been that they can last forever. By comparison to machines and vacuum tubes, they can be engineered to last indefinitely long in terms of any practical time frame. So 50 years, you know, your circuit will still be working. And, you know, 100% of the work in engineering of transistors in the integrated circuit has been around selecting materials, processing, device designs, uh, that enable that exceptional level of reliability. But that might not be what you always want. If you think about, uh, let's say, implanted electronics, in some cases you might like the device to have stable operational characteristics, but only for a finite time frame that might be aligned with a wound healing process, for example, or elimination of cancerous tumor. After those transient processes are done, you might not need the device anymore. And in fact, you might not want the device anymore because it would represent unnecessary device load on the body. And in that case, you would not want electronics that last forever, but rather electronics just last for a brief amount of time and then completely disappear in a biocompatible way. The other uh, context might be in consumer electronics. You think about you know, cell phones today, most people don't want to keep them for more than two years. Why do you engineer the integrated circuit to last for 50? It makes no sense. And besides, it caused all kind of uh, unwanted uh, waste streams associated with uh, recycling and remediation of the devices. Again, you might want a transient electronics technology. So that's something we've been thinking about a lot over the last three years. Is can you create an integrated circuit that's built completely out of water-soluble materials, as an example, uh, that are biocompatible and environmentally benign? Could you do that? And would that provide a different type of technology to complement the applications that are addressed well already with uh, conventional integrated circuits? 
So that's how you did, uh, that's the motivation. So the transient electronic system, the definition, uh, it's electronic systems that dissolve or resorb or otherwise physically disappear at programmed rates or at triggered times, either fully or, or partly. And you know, the question is how do you do that? Uh, what do you do it for? I've already told you about implantables that would disappear, environmental monitors maybe that you don't have to recover, deal with consumer electronic waste would be another one. Uh, and then there's a fourth area, and this is where we get all our funding, and I can't tell you anything about that because it's all in the military and the secure space. So this is a, uh, an unfortunate commentary about our overall funding uh, mechanisms, I, I would say. But any, anyway, this, these are the ones that we're interested in. We're doing a lot of work there. I can't say anything about it. But you can imagine uh, what, what you might uh, do with electronics that can disappear. So how do you do it? It's a material science problem. You think about silicon, you'd immediately say, that's not going to work. Because you think of a silicon wafer as a rock. It's not going anywhere, right? You put it in water, you put it in biofluids, nothing's happening, right? It turns out that's not quite right. And in fact, uh, silicon will undergo hydrolysis uh, with water to form silicic acid at rates that are small but appreciable at physiological conditions. So we get about 37 degrees, 7.4 in terms of pH. That's close to what blood is. Uh, silicon will dissolve at the rate of about 2 nanometers per day. If you put a silicon wafer in this kind of condition, you never notice anything is happening. But if you go back to this very thin silicon that we like to use for flexible electronics, uh, silicon is completely gone in just a few weeks. And you can see that here's AFM, day 0, day 6, day 12. Uh, that 2 nanometer per day begins to be significant. You etch all the way through the silicon, it's completely gone. And by the way, silicic acid is naturally occurring in biofluids and in groundwater and seawater. So it's fully environmentally and biologically compatible. And we stumbled across this immediately recognized that's pretty powerful because if you could do water-soluble electronics with silicon, immediately you could do a lot of sophisticated uh, things in terms of devices. Uh, and you can do that. Now the dissolution depends on a lot of details. I'm going to skip through that. There's a lot of physical chemistry, corrosion chemistry that's going on here. Depends on pH, depends on doping level, depends on uh, crystallinity. Uh, it depends on ionic content as well, but it dissolves in every kind of aqueous solution we've ever looked at. Uh, tap water, seawater, milk, bovine serum, we even put it in Coca-Cola, it slowly dissolves. Uh, sort of interestingly, it's slowest in Coke. You would think that, that would be like <laughs> the most corrosive thing possible, but the problem is the pH is low and you need hydroxyl ions in order to drive that chemistry. So Coke is pretty corrosive, but not so much for silicon. So anyway, you can do that. Uh, you can put uh, biodegradable metals, polymers, dielectric substrates. You can build integrated circuits now that are fully water soluble. And I'm just going to skip through this kind of quickly. Here's what it uh, looks like. This is a cold pits oscillator uh, built with silicon, and it's uh, on a silk substrate. So you drop it in the field. This is a movie developed for DARPA, and then you know it rains, and uh, you know your circuit uh, dissolves away like that. So. This is uh, the kind of thing uh, that you can do. Immediately, you can do all kinds of devices, uh, MOSFETs, uh, inverter circuits, logic gates, photo detectors. You can make digital imagers that are completely water soluble, edible uh, as well. Uh, if you want to eat them, you can do that. Uh, RF uh, rectifiers, you can do uh, power harvesting that way. You might wonder about power supply, how you do batteries. Turns out you can do batteries as well. Water activated electrolytic cell composed of magnesium foils and molybdenum foils. Uh, embedded in a bioresorbable polymer casing, polyanhydride. And so you have energy density here about the same as a lithium ion battery. Power density is about a factor of 10 lower, but you think we can optimize that. But the neat thing about it is it's uh, completely uh, water soluble uh, and you can generate enough power and voltages to do realistic things. These are uh, completely biocompatible as well. You can grow cells on top of these little silicon squares. The cells are happy as the silicon is dissolving at exactly the rates that I was mentioning to you before, a few nanometers per day, and there's no toxicity effects associated with the uh, cell-based assays, uh, and there's no toxicity at the animal level as well. So let me conclude then with this, just give you uh, two, two uh, last uh, points. One is uh, a specific clinical use case that we think, think might be interesting. This is just the first pass, it's still very, very new, but just let me give you one example. So we work with an interventional cardiologist, practicing clinician, who identified this as a problem. It turns out you go into the hospital, you have an operation. You leave the hospital. The most frequent case for a patient needing to be readmitted back into the hospital is an infection that develops at the surgical site. And most of the time, that infection is associated with a bacterial colony that develops as a result of introduction uh, during, during the surgery. And more and more, those bacteria are uh, antibiotic resistant. 
So the normal drug protocol is becoming less and less effective. So instead of a pharmaceutical approach, could you develop an electroceutical approach to address that problem? And so the electronics is configured in the form of a thin film applique. And the vision is it goes inside the body at the last stage of the surgery, just before the patient is sewn up. And then it sits there. And it's configured to allow wireless power transfer from an external coil into a heating element, uh, an individual heating element or an array of them, that creates enough heat to kill bacteria locally. So you can, in real time, in situ, sterilize the uh, surgical site uh, if you need to do that. And it turns out that for this readmission into the hospital, that most critical period is about two weeks after the uh, surgery. Beyond that time frame, the surgical site wound is typically healed sufficiently that the incidence for an infection are much reduced. And so you don't really need the device longer than about a two week period. And in fact, you'd like the device ideally to simply disappear. Otherwise, it just represents unnecessary device load in the body. And that's exactly what we configured this device to do. Uh, by choice of materials and processing conditions, it can survive and provide this heating for about two weeks. At that point, the traces have been sufficiently dissolved that there are open circuits here. And then over the period of about two months, it completely disappears. It just metabolized by the body and dissolves into uh, biocompatible end products uh, by interaction with biofood. So that's one example. So this is the implant. Let me uh, give you one final thing and then, then I'll conclude. So you might wonder, you know, how biocompatible is this? I showed you cell-based toxicity studies. We've done about 100 uh, mouse model experiments looking at biocompatibility. Haven't seen any uh, problems. Uh, you know, that's just a starting point. But you can think about what, you know, what is the elemental content here and how does that relate to naturally occurring levels of those elements in the body? And here's a, an interesting point of comparison. So if you think about this cold pits oscillator, you can ask how much mass does it uh, consist of in terms of magnesium? About 100 micrograms and only about three micrograms of silicon. The silicon and magnesium are very thin. Uh, they're just in sort of uh, trace type geometries and sitting on silk, so not much. If you look at an individual daily vitamin, a multivitamin, it's about 300 milligrams of magnesium and 10 mil, uh, milligrams of silicon. It's about 300 times more silicon and magnesium in a vitamin tablet than in this circuit. So in some ways you could think about this circuit as a vitamin tablet but like a really lousy one, because it doesn't have enough silicon and magnesium. But it does mean it's edible. And so you might ask the question, have I eaten one of these things? And I have, in one occasion. This was at uh, a dare uh, from a DARPA program manager. This was an IED uh, keynote uh, at the end of uh, 2012. And so it's pretty interesting, but it's not that dramatic. You put it in your mouth, it basically dissolves, you swallow it, uh, and that's it. Uh, but I decided I'm only going to do that once, because uh, you know it's not in great taste to do this uh, all, all the time. But, but you can uh, eat them and there's, uh, and there's no problem. So with that, let me just uh, conclude and summarize again what I've told you. I've described some ideas in materials and mechanics and physics of uh, electronic devices that can integrate intimately with the body. I've talked to you about skin. Uh, and then uh, you know, classes of materials allow you to build integrated circuits that can resorb uh, in the body or uh, in the environment uh, at a molecular level due to hydrolysis interaction with uh, water. So these are two things that we're working on. And we think that they're worthwhile academic projects for the uh, following reason, because they embed, I think, some uh, you know, aspects of fundamental science in materials and chemistry and physics around things like you know, cor corrosion and, and bioresorption and soft adhesion and uh, you know, inorganic organic composites, fractal designs, all sorts of, sorts of aspects of interfaces between biological systems and man-made systems. But it's all in the context, we hope, of engineering outcomes that can have broader significance beyond just pure science in the sense of new classes of surgical devices, health and wellness monitors, new implantable uh, devices, brain computer interfaces, prosthetics, uh, and so on. So these are the reasons why we feel that these are worthwhile topics to spend some time on uh, and think about. They're also highly interdisciplinary, so I want to conclude by acknowledging our senior collaborators, theoretical mechanician, Yang Yang Huang, uh, very good collaborator of years, manufacturing guy, Placid. I didn't talk about manufacturing, you have to build these devices and some unusual tools to do that. MOCDD, sort of materials grow, Xu Ling Li, Amy Pollard, dermatologist at Northwestern's Medical School, the hospital there where we have some initial human uh, trials going on. Todd Coleman on uh, data processing, the EMG, EMG Tim Brettel on uh, BMI. Uh, Fio Omanetto and Dave uh, Kaplan are experts on silk. So those are the senior collaborators, but most appropriate for this talk, especially because I'm here with uh, Josh Kuhn, is just an acknowledgement that the students are the most important people here. 
Uh, they do all the work. They come up with a lot of the best ideas. Uh, I just get to talk about it. So I want to thank them for all their contributions. I've been uh, very fortunate to have very talented graduate students and postdocs over the years. Uh, so thank them. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Yeah, I've lived into disulfide or graphene and different things like that. Yeah, I think there's some opportunity for those kinds of materials in these systems. Um, my own thought is just from a purely practical standpoint, if you can do it with silicon, that's the way it's going to happen. I mean, silicon is just way too well established. There's too much you know, knowledge around it. Um, but there may be opportunities for unusual materials at the interface, controlling the interface with the biology. I think it's not at all clear to me that silicon is the optimal choice at that location. So I would view these 2D materials as you know, options that could be added to a platform that's built around you know, thin silicon. I mean, that's kind of a biased perspective. But that's, that's the way I would think about a potential role for that class of material. Um, are there challenges or needs for uh, lithography and similar techniques for working with actual flexible materials? Or do you always already ensure to keep them extremely planted during carbon? So that's a good question. It really um, touches on what is the optimal manufacturing flow for build, building these devices. Um, I think it would depend on the application. You know, area coverage would have a large uh, influence on the thinking around choices in, in lithography or materials deposition. It's a very large area. You might want to do interconnects by inkjet printing and, and use printable conductors, for example. Um, I think you really want to try to stick with silicon. It's hard for me to see how a solution-based processing approach with silicon would give you the kind of orientational control and the, and the yields that you would need. So we've been developing sort of uh, you know, stamping type techniques to move the silicon from the source wafer to the end uh, device substrate. Now from that point on, I think there's a lot of optionality in materials and processing techniques and so on. For most of the devices that we build, we don't do large area, which is not set up to do that kind of system uh, in an academic uh, facility. And most of the devices that we're integrating with the body can be effectively embodied in relatively modest sizes. So we do most of our processing using uh, modestly modified forms of lithographic techniques, uh, PBB uh, methods, on carrier substrates, and then they're separately, uh, subsequently removed from that. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that's the approach you'd want to use for everything. Uh, that's just the way that we're doing it now. Uh, we will have some time after the talk, right. and I will distribute it to the <laughs> Let's Let's take this figure out.